Hi, everyone. Before we go ahead and get started, if anybody needs a hearing device, if you want to raise your hand, Stacy can bring those around. <laughs> Stacy, we got a couple people. He's also helping us with the mic situation because that is not my specialty. So if he wasn't doing that, you would all need the hearing devices today. <laughs> so. I think we have one, two more. All right. Okay. Well, while we're getting those last two handed out, I'm going to go ahead and uh, announce our speaker today. We have Dr. Rebecca Deffler here with us today. She is a clinical instructor and PhD candidate at The Ohio State University. She is instructing third and fourth year students in primary care and low vision rehabilitation at the College of Optometry. Her current research includes study on visually impaired drivers and their on-road safety. She was awarded her OD from New England College of Optometry in 2017 and her MS from Ohio State University in 2019. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and she is a member of the Association of Research and Vision and Optometry. And with that being said, we're very excited to have her here today and I will let her Take the floor. Thanks. So I'm not sure. Oh, this mic is on. Great. Um, I can get a little loud too. So if I'm too loud, shut me down. If I'm not loud enough, let me know, okay? Um, so thank you all for having me. It's my first time over here to Friendship Village of Dublin. You guys have a really nice facility, I've driven by a lot. Uh, didn't know quite how big it was or quite how many of you were interested in vision. So that was pretty exciting for me when I arrived as well. Um, as we said during my intro, I work at the College of Optometry at Ohio State. So that's kind of what brings me here. And I work mainly with patients with vision impairment, um, varying levels of vision problems, but I also see patients in the primary care clinic. So I usually, when I give, when I give talks like this, too close to something, too far away from something. It's the last one. Let me just switch to a hand one. That'll work. All right, am I on here? Is that better? Okay. So usually when I give talks like this, one of the first things I like to do is just open up the floor for questions. Higher still. You got it. I don't talk through a mic a lot. My students tell me I'm too loud, so thank you. Um, so I like to just start by answering questions. So who's got the first burning question about their vision? Anybody want to break the ice? Yes. Diet and vision. Anything in particular related to diet or just general? Absolutely. So what foods are good or maybe bad for the vision? So generally speaking, you can read a lot about diet and vision, and I've done some research on this personally. The biggest things we know about vision and the foods you eat are that eating a varied diet, colorful fruits, green leafy vegetables, um, fish with healthy fats or nuts with healthy fats are all really good for your eyesight. There's not a lot of things you can eat that are bad for your eyes directly. Of course, if you have something like diabetes that can affect the vision, trying to take care of that diabetes through your diet can be really important. Some people probably take eye vitamins, maybe. Some folks in the audience. Those are 
good for you overall. So taking supplements can be a really good idea, especially if your doctor tells you to take them. They've weighed the risks and benefits for you. But for most people who don't have eye disease, just eating a nice varied diet can be really good. Yes. Barbara, I'm going to bring you the mic. Barbara, can you go ahead and just repeat the question? Thanks. What is the best over-the-counter uh, uh, lotion or liquid that you can put for very dry eyes? My eyes are, they feel like they're burning sometimes. They're so dry. Mm -hmm. So the best over-the-counter eye drop. Yep. Mm -hmm. So what is the best over-the-counter eye drop or eye ointment for very dry eyes? So as far as over-the-counter eye drops go, I have two favorite brands, and they, and they have all different types. But my favorite brands are Blink and Sistain. Blink is just like what your eyes do. Sistain is S-Y-S-T-A-N-E, because I see some folks taking notes, which I like. <laughs> Um, both of those are really good quality brand drops where you know what you're getting in the eye drops. We know that they really are what they say they are. I consider them really very comparable, so I buy whatever I have a coupon for. <laughs> there are regular drops that you can use throughout the day, up to four times a day. They're just called tear drops. And then there's a gel drop that's really good to use right before bed, especially if you like to run a fan while you're sleeping. That'll keep the eyes nice and lubricated overnight. If you use your drops more than four times a day, you want to switch to one without preservatives in it. And both of those companies make preservative-free versions. Mm -hmm. Usually we recommend four times, so breakfast, lunch, dinner, bedtime. Yes. Here, I'm going to give you this mic. All my life I've been very nearsighted. Now I'm facing cataract surgery. Mm -hmm. So I, in order to see fine print and everything, I've always gone like this and been able to read it. Once I'm corrected and I'm seeing distance, how in the world am I going to read the fine print? That's a great question. I'm going to repeat that. So the question was um, that you were very nearsighted for your whole life, always wore glasses to see far away, and could take your glasses off to do your reading. No, the, fine print. the fine print, yeah. But now you're going to have cataract surgery soon. And they said, it's going to be great. We're going to make it so you don't need distance glasses. But you're concerned with how you'll read up close. Is that right? Yeah, the real fine print. So there's two things you can do. Um, a lot of people just get reading glasses after their cataract surgery. So instead of wearing glasses to drive and walk around, you'll put glasses on when you need to read the fine print. Yeah, so if you can't read it with your bifocals now, the problem is that you need a stronger pair of reading glasses that lets you hold things closer. So the closer we hold things, the bigger they look, right? But the closer we hold things, the stronger the reading glasses need to be. When's your cataract surgery? Is it soon? Okay. Do you know what your glasses prescription is? Okay. So what you can do is take what your glasses prescription is now. It'll be a minus number, maybe minus four or something. Get that number in a plus in reading glasses. When you're done with the cataract surgery, it'll be the same basically as taking your glasses off. Does that make sense? And worst case, I got some business cards. Come see me when you're done with your cataract surgery. We'll figure it out, okay? All right. Yes. She's going to bring you a microphone. <laughs> Can you define macular degeneration for me? Sure. 
So the question was, what is the definition of macular degeneration? So the macula is a special part of your eye. It's in the back part, which is called the retina, if you're familiar with the retina. The macula is like the center part of the bullseye in the retina. So when you look at something, you use your macula. Some people, as we get older, develop macular degeneration, which basically is when the eye stops doing such a good job getting rid of the waste products it's creating. And we get little buildup of junk, basically, in our retina. And some people, that's all that happens. They get little stuff called drusen. Other people, it gets a little worse, and they have what's called dry macular degeneration, where they get atrophy, breakdown, and death of some of the cells in the back. And it gives you kind of blind spots. But it's tricky because the blind spots don't look black. They're just missing. I describe it to people like, what's behind you? You just can't see it. But it's like that in your eye, so things can look all distorted. That's the dry macular degeneration, and we take eye vitamins for that. There's also what's called wet macular degeneration, which is the kind where you can get bleeding in the back of the eye. And the treatment for that these days is injections into the eye. So you go see the ophthalmologist, the eye surgeon, and they inject your eye with something to stop the bleeding. And those people also get blind spots, but sometimes it looks a little different. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. What causes jagged flashes in the peripheral vision? They're jagged with black, yellow, and silver. And how serious is it? Did everyone hear that question? So it's about what causes flashes in the peripheral vision, jagged flashes? There's a couple different things that can cause flashes in the eyes. I'm going to start with the least serious and work my way up towards the most serious, OK? Some people get flashes in the vision if they stand up too quickly because their blood pressure drops. Happens to the best of us when we're dehydrated or if we're, you know, working on our blood pressure medication. That's not a big deal as long as your blood pressure doesn't cause you to fall down and hurt yourself, right? Eye-wise, not a big problem. Another thing that can cause flashes in the back of the eye is things like if you get hit in the eye or, you know, we all know if we rub our eyes too hard, we'll see stars. Not a problem. Another one can be a normal aging thing called a PVD or posterior vitreous detachment. Folks might have experienced these. There's a jelly in our eyeball called the vitreous. And as we get older, it detaches from the back. And that's normal, but it'll give us flashes when it happens. The two most serious causes of flashes in the back of, or in the peripheral vision, are retinal tears or retinal detachments. And those are both emergencies. That's when the retina, like I mentioned earlier, it's like wallpaper along the back of your eye. And if you have a tear in that wallpaper, it can start to fall off. And that can be really bad for the vision. So if you're having flashes, especially big ones, and if there's any floaters with them, like black pepper, you want to make sure you get in to see an eye doctor really soon so we can make sure it's not a retinal tear or a retinal detachment. Those both often need surgery to make sure that we can keep the vision good. Yeah. Follow-up questions, I like them. <laughs> yes. uh, years ago, I was told that my retinal flashes were a retinal migraine. Can you talk about that? So retinal migraines um, are what, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Beverly has experienced. She's been told her flashes were a retinal migraine. Um, sometimes we call those ocular migraine. 
So some people, when they get migraines, right, they get all of the symptoms ahead of time and then the very bad headache. So things we call aura could be flashes, could be funny little squiggles. Um, some people get just the flashes and the little squiggles without the headache. That's a good one I forgot that causes flashes, thank you. Um, and if you've been diagnosed with that, probably someone dilated your eyes and looked in the back and made sure everything looked healthy. And that's how we make sure it's not a retinal detachment. So migraine aura or retinal migraine is kind of a diagnosis we only come to when we know there's nothing else wrong. Make sense? Yeah, good question. We don't have a good understanding as healthcare professionals of why migraines happen. We think it's related to blood flow. Certain people have migraine triggers, right? All the delicious things in life, good cheese and chocolate. And some people just get them and we never know why. Yeah. Those are usually though in both eyes. Not always, but most often both eyes. Whereas flashes in just one eye would be more likely to be a retinal problem. So if you go and they tell you every year it's just PVDs, how do you ever know if you have a retinal detachment? So if every year you go and they tell you there's nothing wrong with you, it's a PVD, how do you know if you have a retinal detachment? That's a good question. Um, if it's just a big floater that doesn't go away, you can kind of try to keep track of it. If it's flashes all the time, that's not very common um, years and years after a PVD. So I'm sorry, but I don't know. <laughs> Uh, can you overuse your eyes like us at our age? And also, I'm hearing about blue light and even glasses that cut it out, and we're using all these electronics. Uh, is this hard on the eye? That's two of my favorite questions, so I'll do one at a time, okay? Okay. So the first is, can we overuse our eyes with years of use or many hours of use at a time? And using your eyes won't damage them at all, honestly. The biggest risk you have from using your eyes more or, you know, trying to use them too much, I would say, is the more focusing that you do, the less you blink. And so your eyes get drier. So using those artificial tears but you won't make your eyesight any worse by using your vision. You know, in fact, in my line of work, where most of my patients have vision impairment, you know, they have permanent vision issues we can't fix, we tell them all the time, use your eyes as much as you want to. Sometimes it takes a little more work, but you won't make your vision any worse. Um, the second question was about blue light and if screens can damage our vision. And we probably all grew up hearing not to sit too close to the TV and telling our kids and our grandkids not to sit too close to the TV. And I'm here to tell you it's a lie. <laughs> so you can sit as close as you want to the television. The worst thing that will happen is you might get uncomfortable from the light, but it will not permanently damage your vision. So it's another thing I tell my patients. If you can't see the TV, just get closer. It's fine. Blue light glasses, in my semi-professional but mostly personal opinion, are a waste of money. Yeah. So if you have blue light glasses and you like them, that's great. Keep wearing them. But if you don't have blue light glasses and you don't really want new glasses, you don't have to get them just for the blue blocker. Yeah, in theory, it sounds good, and we were all really interested in it. Oh, can we get glasses so people sleep better at night and things like that? But we actually don't get enough blue light off our screens for it to make a big difference. You get a lot more blue light if you walk outside on a blue sky day, so. Sunglasses is the next question. So sunglasses are good for you. So the light that comes from the sun is different, right? So UV light that can give us a sunburn. 
and that can damage the eyes. Research on how much light is needed to damage the eyes depends, right? We're not gonna stick anybody outside and make them stare at the sun for a research experiment. But there is research that shows that like fishermen who spent a lot of time on boats and things in the sun do get cataracts earlier and are at a bit of an increased risk of macular degeneration. But sunglasses also just help keep you more comfortable. They help you see better if you're not dealing with the glare. When you come inside, you can take them off and it doesn't take your eyes as long to adjust. So those are all safety reasons to wear sunglasses. She's gonna bring you a microphone. Um, I was just thinking something that several people that have been close to me in my life have said to me, God, how can you read in the dark? I read with very low light. I do not like bright lights. Mm -hmm. And they said, you're ruining your eyes. And I don't think that's true, but I don't know. Yeah. I go, but my eyes are fine. Don't worry about it. It's a good Use question. Your own eyes and then tell me. You know? It's a good question. So will reading in the dark damage your eyes, I think is the general summary. And it won't. Most people find it harder to read when the lights are dim. But if you find it easier because there's less glare, that's great. Keep doing it. I always say if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes. When I was younger, which we hear that a lot here, <laughs> I had big pupils. But now they're so tiny that even the eye doctor comments on it. Mm -hmm. What is that with age? Is that what causes those to diminish and get so tiny? That's a great question. So with time, will your pupils get smaller? And overall, yes. So overall, as we get older, our pupil gets smaller. There are other things get, that can play a role. So if you're taking certain medications, that can affect the size of the pupil as well. But by and large, it's just part of the aging process. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a very big pupil um, that my fellow eye doctors also comment on. Some people get comments on the small pupil. So it all just depends, but mostly part of aging. Yes. We hear a lot these days about night driving glasses and the military, I guess, perfected that. Is that applicable to the average person? That's another really good question. So what about those glasses that are supposed to help us drive at night? So this is when we get into my research area. So if I get in too deep, just start yelling at me. Okay. So in the state of Ohio, there are different requirements for your vision, for you to be able to drive during the day versus be able to drive at night. Okay. So when you go into a motor vehicle and you put your head in the tiny box, and they tell you, here's your license, or here's your license daytime only. The special glasses that are supposed to help you drive at night, um, first of all, you can't use them for your driving exam. So even if they really did help, it wouldn't matter, because the state of Ohio, right, the BMV, would say, take those off. But also, most of those glasses have kind of a yellowish tint on them. And some people feel like yellow tint helps them with glare. There's not really research that supports that necessarily, but a lot about vision is subjective, right? It's just what you think about your vision and how your eyes feel. So those glasses that you can see advertised on TV or things, you know, sometimes home shopping has them, military issue, they don't really work all that well. So you might say, well, why do, I and all of my friends have trouble driving at night, right? It's a good question. There's two reasons. Um, the first is as we get older, our eye just gets a little less good at seeing. Even if we don't have any eye diseases or eye problems, it's like everything else in your body. Sometimes it just doesn't work quite as well, right? Gets the job done, but not like when we were 16 learning how to drive. The second reason is a lot of people, as they get older, develop things like cataracts or macular degeneration or other eye conditions. 
that even if your vision is pretty good, right, you can still read 2020 or 2025 on the eye chart. When we do more intense measurements of vision, we notice that your vision's not as good. So basically, the magic nighttime glasses aren't really magic. Yeah. And headlights are really bright because now those new LED headlights are just, yeah, everybody hates them except the person whose car they're on, right? So um, they're really bright and they can give you a lot of glare problems, but nothing we can do about that, I guess, because the car manufacturers don't listen to people like me. So, <laughs> yes, I've got two down here. You've got, oh, <laughs> so polite. <laughs> We have two eyes, right? Do they talk to each other? Do our eyes talk to each other? Uh, yes and no. So if you have a normal visual system, one eye gets the information, sends it to the brain, and then the brain will also tell the other eye what to do. And there's a little bit of crosstalk in between in the middle of the brain. So basically, if I want to look to the left, both of my eyes go together, and that's because they're talking to each other. But let's say something happened and I lost one eye. I lose a little bit of vision, but my other eye does pretty well on its own. So two eyes generally better than one, but you don't need both. Mm -hmm. Some people might know people in their lives or they themselves have like a cross-eyed, or have a, had a crossed eye as a kid. And some of those people have surgery to straighten their eye out, but some people don't, right? We all know people in our lives who their eyes are always kind of looking at two different things. And when that happens, we'd get double vision unless the connection in our brain between the eyes turned itself off. So sometimes they don't talk to each other. And usually that's better in those situations. Did you still have a question? I have it. Okay. There's a new product on the market called Vuity, and it's been approved, and one drop in uh, each eye in the morning, and you can go without your reading glasses all day. I wondered about that. And also, I had a stroke a year ago, which only affected the um, part of my brain that controls my eyesight. And I wonder if eventually... I don't think I see quite the, as well as I did, but I wonder if that will continue to deteriorate. Two very good questions. So the first question was about a new eye drop called Vuity. And I'm gonna look around and make sure none of the drug company people are here before I tell you what I really think about Vuity, okay? So I was um, on a research team that got started doing some research studies with Vuity, and I'm no longer involved with them, but for an unrelated reason. Um, Vuity is an eye drop that is designed to make it so you don't need your reading glasses. The people Vuity works best for, because there are people who really like it, the people it works best for are in their early to mid-40s. So right when you started needing reading glasses, that's the people it works the best for, okay? Now, when I start needing reading glasses, would I use this drop? I'm gonna be honest with you, I wouldn't. There's a lot of side effects of it. Um, they're not really bad side effects, but I think wearing glasses is easy. So I'm just gonna do that. Some of the things it can do is give you headaches or it makes your pupil very small which is how it works, um, and it can make it harder to see in, in dim or dark lighting. So um, I don't think any of you should run out and get Vuity prescriptions, okay? No. How do you spell it? V-U-I-T-Y. So it's brand new. It only got FDA approved, I don't know, maybe two months ago. We haven't done too much of it at the college yet. Um, we just don't have a big market for it right now. There are advertisements, there are advertisements yes, on TV. Oh, on TV? Okay. Um, and I've seen them in the magazine and things. 
That's a good question. I don't remember. I think, yeah, I don't know. There's only a couple of them, and I don't want to give you the wrong one. I apologize. Mm -hmm. Yes? How does glare figure into eyesight? Oh, and then I'll come back to your second question in a second. I apologize. So um, glare is involved in a couple of ways in eyesight. So if you have cataracts, if you haven't had cataract surgery yet, you're more likely to experience glare. And cataracts, for people who maybe aren't real familiar, is when the lens inside your eye starts to get cloudy and more yellow. Like when you drive a really old car and you need the windshield replaced. It's the same thing with the lens in your eye. So they take out your lens that has a cataract and they put a new plastic lens in that you get to keep. And that can help with the glare. Um, it's like looking through a dirty window, right? The light kind of scatters around and it's unpleasant. It's like a lens, what? Oh, okay. I don't know lens baby, but. Like a soft focus, yes, soft focus lens. So it can make things blurrier and more cloudy and more glare. So glare can affect your vision because it can make it uncomfortable to see, but it can also just make it harder to see through it, which I know seems like a silly thing to describe, right? But I think of it when I go outside on a day when it just rained, but then the sun comes out and I get all the reflections. It's like very uncomfortable and hard to see. That's glare. Some people, if they have a very large pupil, experience more glare. Other people, if they have a very small pupil, experience more glare because they get more light bouncing around in the eye. But basically, it's a comfort issue. Yeah. So then your question about your stroke. So you had a stroke, you said, about a year ago, and it affected just your vision. Okay. And you're wondering if it's going to get worse. Is that correct? Okay. So when we have a stroke that affects just the vision, generally speaking, it affects vision to either the left or to the right, but equally in both eyes because the eyes talk to each other in the brain. It's like you two prep me for each other. It's good. Um, so when you lose vision to the left, for example, in both eyes, it's like those blind spots we talked about earlier. It doesn't look black over there. Your vision just ends too early. And sometimes when people have a stroke like that, they recover some of that vision. Usually most of the vision, if it's going to come back, comes back in the first six months to a year after the stroke. Some people, though, have permanent vision loss after a stroke, but we don't expect it to get worse unless there's another event or another issue. But by and large, once you hit the one-year mark, you kind of are where you're going to be for better or worse. Then I didn't really need to get the big so you didn't need the big numbers on the remote? Maybe not, but now if you lose your reading glasses, you can still watch TV, right? So it's good. Yes. Uh, about a year ago, my wife had a, uh, a stroke, one of a good many she's had over the last 10 years, and it uh, affected her left side, her left leg, her left arm are not as functional as they could be. It also affected her right peripheral vision. And I understand that the left eye communi communicates with the brain on the right side, and the opposite is true of the right eye. Is that, in fact, the case? Yes, so that's pretty much true. So um, I'm not going to repeat your whole question, but basically, to sum up the answer, if you have a stroke that affects your mobility on the left side, it's most likely going to affect your vision on the right side. And that's because the right side vision from both eyes is processed on the left side of your brain. So there's a whole lot of crisscrossing of the vision in the brain 
which is why the eyes can move together and why the right side of the vision in both eyes is affected in a stroke. But generally, yes, the vision and the mobility are on opposite sides. Is hearing the same? I'll be ashamed to admit. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I think hearing doesn't, I don't know. I apologize. Yeah. It's been a long time since I took neuroanatomy. <laughs> yes. Talk about glaucoma. Ooh, that could be a six hour lecture. You sure you want to listen to me that long? I'm kidding. <laughs> so glaucoma is an eye disease that affects your peripheral vision. And we generally think of it as an eye disease that is very hard to detect until it starts having big problems, unless you're going in for routine exams when we might pick it up. So if you never get an eye exam until you start having problems from glaucoma, it's kind of too late to do much about the glaucoma. There's a lot of different types of glaucoma. The most common has to do with the pressure inside the eye. So you might remember going to the eye doctor and they either bring a blue like donut shaped light very close to your eye or they do a puff of air in your eye. I don't like that one. Um, find it very uncomfortable. So that's how we measure the pressure inside the eye. And if the pressure's too high, it damages the optic nerve. The optic nerve is like the cable that connects your eye to your brain and sends all the information. And if it gets damaged, it can't send the right information. And you'll end up with missing parts in your side vision. The most common ways we treat glaucoma, in this country, we usually start with drops. In Europe, they do surgery first. Just different schools of thought. So we start with drops. Some people get a laser procedure. So there's drainage in your eye. Think of like a sewer. And if your storm sewer is full of leaves, we got to get the leaves out so that water can go down. Same thing in your eye. Got to clean out the angle so that the fluid can flow on out. So that's the other way um, that we treat glaucoma. Iridotomy, yes. So, yes, can I explain peripheral iridotomy? That's good. My students don't even remember that term. Um, peripheral iridotomy is if you have the kind of glaucoma that is caused by a narrow drainage angle. So we want the angle, you know, shaped like this. If you got a little narrow guy, they'll take a laser and they shoot a little hole in your iris, the colored part of your eye. And that helps open up the angle. So it helps... Uh, open up the drainage angle to keep the pressure lower so that we don't develop glaucoma. Is, is it permanent? Yes, generally. Um, rarely the hole closes up with a little bit of scar tissue, but they're usually permanent. And then some people have high pressure, and then once they get their cataract surgery, their pressure goes down because the cataract in your eye, as your lens gets cloudy, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, so it can smush the angle. Mm -hmm. Smush, yes, very technical. <laughs> yes. Uh, every once in a while, I'll get a, uh, a cloud that goes over a portion of my, one of my eyes, and it lasts for about 15 minutes, then it goes away. But it's kind of annoying. Yeah. Just once in a while. So a cloud over part of the vision once in a while that goes away. Um, clouds in our vision can be from a lot of stuff. Um, probably it has to do with either dryness or a little bit of debris in your tear film, which is kind of the clear part over the front of your eye. So blinking, if you blink, does it go away quicker? You're not sure, try that next time. So try blinking a bunch, that'll clear out the stuff, right? It's like putting on the windshield wipers. Um, so blinking can often help, that's often a tear film problem if it's cloudy and if it goes away. If you're experiencing 
total blackouts of your vision for short amount of t- short amounts of time even if they go away on their own but you know every couple of days or every week or something you're noticing you're getting a blackout of your vision in one eye you should let your doctor know that can be a problem um, sometimes that sometimes that can have to do with the blood flow um, and can be signs that a stroke might be coming but cloudy is probably the tears you're welcome I have macular degeneration in the top of my right eye, but not the bottom. And I, will it move down, or could it just stay where it is? So if we have macular degeneration in the top of one eye, will it move down, or will it stay where it is? Unfortunately, it's very hard to predict. So when we have macular degeneration, sometimes it kind of stays where it is and we're very lucky and sometimes it gets worse and we don't know why so that's um one of the things i've done research on in the past is why some people have better vision with macular degeneration than others and i hate to say i didn't figure it out go figure right so it's kind of complicated um do you see an eye doctor pretty regularly Yeah, so if you see your eye doctor regularly, and if they're indicating you need treatment, I would listen to them. But without an indication for treatment, there's not much we can do, except don't smoke. So if anybody's a smoker, this is my blanket, should all stop smoking. Um, It's pretty much the only preventable risk factor we know for a lot of eye diseases, so... I'm sorry? A-reds. AREDs can help in some cases, cases, yeah. So some people take AREDs, which is an eye vitamin, um, but only certain people with macular degeneration need them. Everybody needs to not smoke. But thank you for the reminder. <laughs> yes? I just want to say that uh, yellow vision is really good for me at night. Yellow vision is really good for you at night. Okay. Yeah. Some people like yellow tinted glasses at night. Overall, um, I wouldn't do too much experimenting with sunglasses at night, like while actively driving, right? It's not safe. But if you want to walk around and check out the other cars and see what you might want to try, I think that's okay. Yeah, good. Yes. Thanks. I'm sorry, I didn't, I only heard part of that. <laughs> NSAIDs, like NSAIDs. Mm-hmm. Ibuprofen, do they have an impact on vision? Yeah, do NSAIDs, over-the-counter, like ibuprofen and Tylenol or naproxen have an impact on the eyes and the vision? Overall, not really. Um, I mean, everything can impact the vision if you're taking it improperly or way too much. But those are some of the things that we prescribe to people having eye pain. So if you have a scratched cornea, for example, or after a cataract surgery, sometimes we prescribe things like naproxen or ibuprofen. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna cheat and ask a question. Um, If you could just talk some about the role of your vision and avoiding falls. Yes. So your vision and avoiding falls. So I would say vision, as we all know, is pretty important for a lot of things related to getting around, right? So there's a lot of things that can play a role in falls. And vision is definitely one of them. There's been research that shows that people with eye diseases, like glaucoma in particular, there's been a lot of work on glaucoma, are more likely to fall. And one of the reasons is that if you have an eye disease, your vision is less reliable than it used to be. So you might think you're seeing just fine and think you're seeing everything you need to. But if you have an eye disease, you might be missing things and not even know it, right? If you can't see it, you don't know you didn't see it. So things like marking the steps or like these stairs are painted in a lighter color 
so that you know that they're there, that's really helpful. If you're going up and down stairs, take a minute when you get to the top, right? Get your footing, check out where the stair is, but then rely on your handrails and your balance. I talked earlier about sunglasses. Those can be really important in falls because as we get older, it's harder for our eyes to adjust from very bright light to dim light to bright light and so on. So when you come out of the movie theater and it's super bright out, it'll take you longer to adjust than it did if you take your five-year-old grandkid with you, right? They're like running through the parking lot. Um, And so making sure you take time to let your eyes adjust when you go into or come out of a certain environment. Sunglasses can help because if you put them on when it's bright out and then take them off when you get inside, your eyes are already adjusted to the same amount of light. If you have a serious vision problem and you have questions about your safety getting around, you might have seen people use the long white canes, right? Blind folks use those long white blind canes. And I help people get set up to get training with those to help them stay safe. So if anyone has specific questions about vision impairment and walking, I can talk to you afterwards. Um, But really just making sure we work with our lighting situations, I think is one of the most important things with falls. The other thing is if you live in an environment with someone else, or if you have visitors and you're worried about falling, make sure that they know to put all your stuff back where they found it, right? So if you've got like a small dog that you're gonna step on or a cat, put a bell on it so you hear it, you don't have to look for it. If people come over and they leave their stuff all over your floor, make them clean it up before they leave. I'm very anti-throw rug. They look nice and they are a hazard, right? So just trying to limit the amount of stuff you need to look for so that you don't fall can be important. Yes, I like this, I'm getting my steps in too. Uh, When I went to the doctor, he gave me a number of my eyes. He said like 24, 25, I can't remember. And if I got to a 27, I couldn't drive at night. No, I have no idea what he was talking about. So the question is, your eyes are 24 on some scale. We don't know what. And the doctor told you if you get to 27, you can't drive at night. I don't know what that means. So in my line of work, the things that are usually in their mid-20s and we don't want to get any higher are the eye pressures, which can be related to glaucoma. But if you have, if your eye pressure goes higher and you need glaucoma drops or something, we don't punish you by also taking away your night driving, unless there's something else I don't know about you. So night driving is based Um, There's two things involved in driver licensure in Ohio. One is your side vision, your peripheral vision, visual field, and the other is your visual acuity, how small you read down the eye chart. And visual field is the same for day and night driving. You just have to meet a certain standard to get any kind of license. And then day and night driving is based solely on how small you read down the eye chart. So I don't know. But like I said earlier, I've got my cards. If you need a driving exam, give me a call. (laughs) You gotta come down to medical campus, so pluses and minuses, but. (laughs) Any additional questions for Dr. Deffler before we let her go? Yes. At what point are you considered blind? At what point are you considered blind? So we say that blindness is a spectrum. So you can be blind anywhere from what we call totally blind or no light perception, which means that you don't see at all out of either eye. And then there's a whole range of people all the way until you get to a point where there's a certain line you can't read on the eye chart. 
And there's also people who read really small down the eye chart, but have very little peripheral vision that are also considered blind. And it's all based on your better seeing eye. So if I were to walk out of here and, I don't know, decide to be a pirate, it wouldn't matter because my other eye sees really well. I mean, it would matter. But like the government, they don't care. The people who decide the blindness statutes. It's all based on your better seeing eye. So most people quote a level of 2200 or 10 times bigger than normal or a 20 degree visual field, which is about like this big. So it's complicated. And then there's a whole subset of people who have reduced peripheral vision, but not to the level of legal blindness, and reduced central vision, but not to the level of legal blindness. And there's some fancy math that we can do at the clinic to determine if, you're, if you meet the criteria for what's called visual disability, which is basically the same as legal blindness, at least for like social security purposes. So you'll see people out in the world, maybe who use those long white canes, and then you also see them pull out their cell phone. And they're not lying. Their vision is just very complicated and very unreliable. And so they've learned how to use a cane instead to walk safely. If you watch, um, like I'm a big runner, if you watch the Boston Marathon, you'll see folks run the marathon with a guide by and large, those folks are not totally blind, but they have vision that wouldn't let them run a marathon, get around crowds of people without a helper, so they use a guide. Yeah. Yes. Based on experience, the IRS recognizes Best Eye uh, 2200 or better. Yes, so 2200 is generally the cutoff for the, for the taxes and things. It's a little different in my clinic because I have a really specific eye chart, um, again, just based on the patient population. But basically, yeah, 2200 is what the government wants. Or we write you a really compelling letter, and sometimes that works. Yeah. That's a long walk, I apologize. <laughs> Are there any other uh, vision aging issues that our questions haven't referred to that you think would be important to know? Yeah, that's a great question. Other things related to vision and aging. Um, I would say it's, you know, making sure you get your regular eye exams is really important, and I kind of alluded to that, but an eye exam every one to two years is really important, and Medicare pays for them. If you guys have Medicare, they'll pay for an eye exam. And making sure when you go in for that exam, you're not shy about asking your questions. But also, it's hard to remember all your questions when you're in with the doctor. You can bring a list. We don't mind. And if you've got someone that spends a lot of time with you that listens to you complain about your vision a lot, bring them along too, right? I always tell my mom, when you go in for your exam, just put me on speaker. I'll tell the doctor all your problems. She doesn't listen to me and then calls me later, but it's fine, right? So bringing your list and things like that, but getting your eye exams and updating your glasses if it's recommended. After you have cataract surgery, you usually don't need very many glasses updates. Your vision stays pretty much, your prescription stays pretty much stable. But if your glasses are really scratched, right, that's not good. You wanna be able to see clearly. Um, other things related to vision and aging, you know, that's my big ones, because then if something comes up, your doc eye doctor will see it and be able to help you. Excuse me, the hiccups. Yeah, did you have another a follow-up? Oh, sorry. That's a different question. Oh, sure. Can you tell us the difference between optometry and ophthalmology? Yes, optometry versus ophthalmology. So we in eye care think of what we call the three O's. There's ophthalmology, which is eye surgeons, so people that do your injections, laser surgeries, cataract surgeries optometrists, that's what I do. We do all kinds of routine eye care. We do dilated health exams. We prescribe glasses and contact lenses and medications. But we don't do anything where we would need to 
break the barrier of the skin. So no injections and no surgeries. We also have specialties. So like I said, I do low vision. So I do magnifying glasses and telescopes and special glasses for driving. And then there's um, opticians or opticianry. Those are the folks that design and make your glasses. So we all work together. Can you comment on the, on the problems of convergence uh, and double vision? Comments on convergence and double vision. So convergence is when you want to look at something up close. Your eyes come together to look at it. And when you want to look far away, it's called divergence. Your eyes go more straight to look at things. Some people have trouble with converging. They either don't converge enough, their eyes don't come in together enough, or they converge too much, and the eyes kind of like cross over. And that can give you double vision, where instead of seeing one of something, you see two. There's a couple ways people treat that. Um, depending on some kinds of eye turns, you might have a surgery, usually as a kid. We might prescribe glasses with prism, just, just fancy glasses, or you might do eye teaming exercises, what we call vision therapy, to help your eyes get stronger. So like if you need to lift a 10 pound weight, you start with lighter ones till you're good at it. Same thing with convergence. We start easier and build you up. Well, with that, just to be respectful of everyone's time, we'll cut it off there. But thank you so much for coming, Dr. Duffel. This has been really informative. Thank you for having me. Hey, friends, I want to do a quick plug. Um, I know some of you are signed up for Wowzitude tomorrow. Um, if you were all like, hoping to go to San Francisco, California, well, we're going to Lima, Peru instead. So I just want everybody to know that. So if you come to Wowza 2 tomorrow or tune in on uh, 1851 um, and you're like, huh, this doesn't look like San Francisco, that's because it's not. So I just want to let everybody know since most of you guys are signed up. Thanks. See ya.